And Dr. Holmes is an internationally renowned breast surgeon and cancer researcher, currently serving as interim director of the Margie Peterson Breast Center at Providence St. John's Health Center and interim director, uh, John Wayne Cancer Institute Breast Surgery Fellowship Program. I am so excited to hear about this new technique being used to treat women with breast cancer. Please help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Dennis Holmes. I think I had some notes that I needed to uh, take out. <laughs> I, was t I was told by Laura to take the centerpiece, so this is my contribution. <laughs> May I have the first slide, please? So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this evening and to talk about uh, some new clinical data regarding the use of cryoablation or tumor freezing for the treatment of early stage breast cancer. Uh, the tagline, the choices that we make, is I think quite relevant because it not only speaks to the choices that our patients make, but also the choices that healthcare providers make to make sure that uh, effective and reasonable treatment options are available to patients to choose from. And that's actually treatment options as well as screening options that are available to, to patients from which to choose. I am inspired as a healthcare provider by this slide, which basically makes the point that women diagnosed with small invasive cancers, the size of a dime or smaller, have excellent long-term survival. About 90% or better will be alive 25 years later to talk about their story. This is quite, uh, it gives me lots of optimism. Uh, but, and because of this, uh, it is my mission as a breast cancer surgeon and researcher to participate in the development and the promotion of technologies that reduce the burden of care, that reduce the harm of care, that improve the long-term survival of patients, and that offer them options that are appropriate for their specific cancers and also that are appropriate for their own level of risk tolerance because not everyone is willing to accept the same treatment. Now, if all cancers were the same, if they were a nail, for example, we'd only need one solution. But as we've learned over the last 10 to 15 years, cancers vary widely genetically. They also vary behaviorally in terms of their tendency to spread and so forth. So we need to have a range of treatment options available that are appropriate for various kinds of cancers. Cryoablation is one of those options. Now, cryoablation means basically cryo, which is freezing cold, extremely cold temperatures, and using that to ablate or to remove a tumor. The concept of cryoablation is not new. It's been around for about 100 years or more. And in fact, for much of the last century, it's been used quite frequently to treat cervical cancer, liver cancer, cancers of the skin, and kidney. But its application to treating breast tumors has primarily been limited over the last 15 years to treating benign breast tumors. We weren't quite ready, for reasons that I don't really understand, to treat breast cancers with cryoablation. But that has changed, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. Now, the concept of cryoablation is fairly simple. We use a needle-like probe that's inserted through the center of the tumor, which is shown here in black, and we freeze the tumor to a very cold temperature, about minus 185, and also freeze a rim of tissue around the tumor just to be confident that we've encompassed the tumor completely. It's essentially ablating or freezing the same volume of tissue that we would remove if we were to perform a lumpectomy. The procedure is typically performed under ultrasound guidance. If you've ever had a breast biopsy performed, it's very much like that procedure. We, use, uh, we have a patient who's in, who comes to the office. Uh, we use local anesthetic. The patient's awake. We make a small nick in the skin, insert a needle through the skin opening, through the center of the tumor. The tumor is frozen using two freeze-thaw cycles. The total treatment time takes about 30 to 45 minutes, depending upon the size of the cancer. Once the treatment is completed, the probe is withdrawn, pressure is applied to the skin puncture site for about five minutes, and then a band-aid is applied and the patient can drive herself home. That's the entire procedure. 
The early data uh, derived in the U.S. regarding the efficacy, uh, effectiveness of cryoablation was based upon this trial that I'm showing you here, the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group trial Z1071. I was a participant in that trial. In this trial, women underwent cryoablation and then underwent removal of their tumors just to prove that cryoablation works. Uh, this is a, a sort of a, an outline of the trial. We basically enrolled women with tumors under the size of two centimeters. That's about the size of a nickel. They underwent cryoablation. They underwent an MRI after the cryoablation procedure. And about four weeks after the cryoablation procedure, they underwent lumpectomy. And the key question in this trial was how successful could cryoablation be in this population of women? As judged by the, the detection, or the, rather, the, say the absence of cancer found in the lumpectomy specimen. So all the lumpectomy specimens were studied to see what proportion of women would actually have residual disease. How effective was it? Well, the results were published last year in the trial, uh, and I was one of the co-authors of this publication. Uh, and what it found is that for tumors two centimeters or smaller, cryoblation was 92% effective at completely eradicating tumor within the breast. And for tumors under one centimeter, it was 100% effective at killing tumors. Uh, and so this really laid the foundation for this to become a standard treatment option in the US. Now, there were 8% of women that had cancers that were not completely ablated. And what we know from what the imaging presentation that we saw earlier today is that sometimes the mammograms, MRI, and other studies don't show you the full extent of the cancer. So we may target an area, not appreciating if the cancer is actually larger than what we see. So what's key about cryoablation, number one, is that it works. But number two, we have to choose the right patients that have well-visualized small tumors that can be accurately targeted to deliver effective cryoablation. Now, the next logical step uh, to the study that I presented was to, or is to, perform a study in which we cryobate the tumor, but simply leave it in place without the requirement for surgery. And in fact, the way that we would verify complete ablation is to perform a needle biopsy of the tumor and follow-up imaging without, without requiring that the patient go to surgery for therapy. I had the privilege this is in 2009, to work with one of the global pioneers in cryoblation, Dr. Fukuma, who, who was based in Japan, who at that time had already set about the, the task of offering cryoblation to women with small breast tumors uh, without the requirement for subsequent surgery. Uh, he was well on his way at that moment to uh, reporting out the results of 38 patients that, age, that were aged approximately 53, who had tumors less than or equal to one centimeter, who underwent a needle biopsy one to two months after their cryoblation procedure, which verified that the tumor was in fact dead. None of the patients underwent surgery. The patients did go on to receive endocrine therapy or anti-estrogen therapy and radiotherapy. And at 43 months of follow-up, which is about three and a half years of follow-up, there were no recurrences within the breast and no patient had experienced a distant uh, failure, a distant recurrence. Now, Quite coincidentally, Dr. Fukuma was in Los Angeles this past Monday, and I had dinner with him. And he shared with me that at this point in time, he has about 200 patients that he's treated. He has follow-up of up to 10 years for some patients, and he, has ha and he has a recurrence rate of 2%, which is less than what we get with standard therapy. So it really shows that we're on a right path with offering cryoblation to a woman with small cancers that are well targeted. This is one of his patients, five years after cryoblation. The treated breast is a breast on the left. It looks, it looks normal, except for a small skin puncture wound uh, that's, that's pointed out by that arrow. This is a patient's imaging study. You see the image to the left is an MRI, which shows a white tumor near the chest muscle. And this is an MRI performed about two years after cryoblation, where you see no cancer present where the cancer was once present. This was accomplished with cryoblation, not with surgery. The early US experience from the trial that I presented earlier, as well as what I've learned over the years from Dr. Fukuma, inspired me uh, to write a clinical trial to explore the use of cryoblation as a standalone therapy for appropriate women. And we designed this trial and call the trial the FROST trial, which means freezing alone instead of removal of small breast tumors. 
It's a single arm study of cryoablation for the treatment of early stage breast cancer. And I'm happy to say it's sponsored by Sonaris Technologies, which is one of the co-sponsors of this evening's event. Uh, the study is now open to women uh, with uh, age of 50 or older with invasive breast cancer, tumor size 1.5 centimeters or smaller, tumors that are well visualized by ultrasound as shown by the upper image, and tumors that are well visualized by MRI as shown by the lower image. The tumors must be estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, and they must have a minimal amount of non-invasive breast cancer because non-invasive breast cancer is one of those things that that's very hard to see on ultrasound and can be and, and may be left behind or, untarge, or left untargeted if uh, the patient has a significant amount of that coexisting with invasive breast cancer. The basic design of the trial is as follows. Patients start off with a needle biopsy, which diagnoses, establishes the diagnosis of cancer. They undergo baseline imaging and then cryoablation. After cryoablation, uh, they undergo a biopsy of the cryoablation site six months after the cryoablation procedure. They'll then go on to receive anti-estrogen therapy and follow-up imaging. We uh, divide the patients into two groups. There's a group that's age 70 and older and the group between age 50 and 69. Patients age 70 and older will undergo cryoablation, receive anti-estrogen therapy, but will undergo no further surgery, no lumpectomy, no lymph node biopsy, no breast radiotherapy, just cryoablation and endocrine therapy. The younger age group, the 50 to 69 year olds, will undergo cryoablation and anti-estrogen therapy and are expected to receive radiotherapy, but lumpectomy is optional, or lymph, uh, lymph node biopsy is optional in those patients, uh, and chemotherapy may be indicated in some, but given that these patients generally have favorable small tumors, its chemotherapy is unlikely to be indicated for those patients. The cryoablation procedure is performed using a liquid nitrogen-based cryoablation system called the VSCA2, which is one of the devices made by Sonaris. Uh, as I mentioned, at six months after the cryoablation procedure, we perform a needle biopsy of the cryoablation site and any other adjacent area that might seem a little unusual, just to document that the residual findings are benign, that is non-malignant. And the patient also undergoes serial imaging, mammograms, ultrasound, and MRI for five years, just to monitor the site to document that there's no evidence of cancer recurrence. The goal of the FROST trial, the primary goal, is to determine the rate of successful ablation as measured by the absence of residual cancer detected in that six-month needle biopsy. But we'll also look at the incidence of a recurrence of cancer within the breast, the incidence of recurrence of cancer within the axilla or the underarm area, the lymph nodes, uh, to document the side effects of the procedure and also to look at the cosmetic res results. We anticipate that a few patients may indeed require surgery. Those are the individuals that may not be able to complete the cryoblation procedure because of either technical failures or because the patient is un unable to tolerate the procedure. Mostly it's about being able to stay still for 30 to 45 minutes, not really because they're having pain. The issue, the issue is mostly just positioning, so we try to make them as comfortable as possible. Uh, the, of course, if a patient is detected, uh, found to have residual cancer at the site six months later, they would be advised to undergo surgical therapy. And of course, during the five years of screening, if a patient is found to have a recurrence, they would again undergo surgical therapy to manage that recurrence. The results of the FROST trial are not yet known because, of course, it's a trial that's ongoing, but I can tell you that all of the patients that have undergone a core biopsy or needle biopsy at the six-month time point to date have not been found to have residual cancer at the cryoablation site. So I think we are, we're on the right path. And in fact, I think based upon the information that, that I've since learned on Monday from Dr. Fukuma and what we're seeing from our own experience, it's clear that cryoblation will one day soon become a standard treatment option for women presenting with small, well-visualized invasive breast cancer. Now, I do want to just uh, draw your attention to this uh, image here because, you know, I'm very optimistic about uh, cryoblation, but I think a perfect testament to the optimism is the fact that the CEO of the company, the company that makes the device, was diagnosed with breast cancer not very long ago, and she came to me for cryoblation. 
And her story has been recorded and is available on the Sonaris website if you want to take a look at it. But I think this is a perfect uh, testament to her confidence in the procedure and sort of voting not just with her money, but with her breasts to show that she believes in this technology. So in summary, I'd like to end by drawing attention to uh, the most inspiring fortune cookie I ever encountered. I do a lot of my research writing late at night and often at a restaurant that has fortune cookies. <laughs> and one night, uh, I opened the fortune cookie and I read this, uh, this uh, quote. We cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. And it spoke to me immediately as if the words were written just as I understood them, which is that as cancer doctors and as, as advocates, we cannot change a, a woman's diagnosis once it has been received. Once she's been diagnosed with breast cancer, we cannot turn back the clock. But there's a lot that we can do to alter her journey and to make sure that her breast cancer journey is as smooth as possible. I see cryoablation and other innovations in breast cancer care as methods and techniques that we can use to make sure the breast cancer journey remains as easy as possible, as easy as we can, to, can accomplish. And so, you know, 10 years later, this, this fortune cookie stays in my presentation because I think hopefully it's something that will speak to you as well as it speaks to me. Thank you very much.